Well, thank you so much, Tom, and uh, everybody involved. Can you hear me okay? Just nod for those. Okay, super. Um, and uh, thank you to uh, Carlos, uh, who is sitting in the background here for um, having helped me set this up. So, Tom, I took uh, your, uh, you by your word uh, that this is uh, very much a conversation style. I didn't come with a presentation. I have a couple of slides that I may or may not uh, use, and uh, Carlos put those uh, on my system because sometimes a picture is uh, worth uh, a thousand, thousand words. I um, really uh, appreciate this opportunity. I feel like sometimes we're a little secret society um, that maybe is becoming a little less uh, secret uh, in, in uh, our work. Uh, and I think we have uh, huge contributions to make uh, to social justice. Um, thanks for your kind introduction. I uh, feel a little bit set up by that. Uh, when people talk about you, I sometimes wonder who that person is. Um, because uh, when you're kind of on the inside of this 58-year-old system, uh, you know lots more than the things that Jeff said about me. Uh, so I can view them in context, and uh, maybe it is context that I want to provide uh, to you, if that's okay, uh, as a start uh, for how I ended up in that work. And then I might speak a little bit about uh, where my work is at. Is that an okay way to go? Sure. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and also, please do uh, feel free uh, to, to interrupt me. Um, I was um, uh, immensely uh, honored, and that's uh, a term that uh, is a very difficult word to use uh, for somebody of German nationality to have uh, received the award, uh, probably uh, for, for many reasons, but two being the main ones. One is I know of all the fabulous work that is going on uh, by community practitioners and community psychology practitioners. Um, and uh, I view myself uh, as just one little puzzle piece within that. But the other one is that I essentially kind of feel that I have drifted into the work that I have done more by, uh, as my mom would say about me, um, good luck than common sense. So I'll tell you a little bit about my own history because I think one of the key principles that I learned quite early on uh, in community psychology is to put ourselves into the context so to not be perceived as experts. And I've always taken that principle uh, very seriously. Sometimes that means that we have to make ourselves somewhat vulnerable. Uh, in terms of uh, sharing our stories, so I make myself a little bit vulnerable here. So as you can hear from my accent, uh, I'm from uh, Germany. Uh, where I left uh, at 19 um, after um, a, a kind of a disastrous time in high school, uh, which led to me dropping out and vowing never to have anything to do with academia ever again. Um, I uh, went to England uh, more by uh, luck than planning. And uh, after a, a year and a bit in a variety of human service type jobs, um, I landed a job uh, in a psychiatric hospital. Uh, it's in a place called Chichester. Hospital is called Grayling. Grayling well, it's a, a training hospital. And, uh, and as I shared at uh, APA, um, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. Uh, because uh, here I had a full-time job with benefits and paid vacation doing something that was going to help human beings. And while I may have been a rebel in high school, I never lost my passion for uh, trying to be uh, helpful uh, to my fellow human beings. And uh, there's many stories I could tell about that, some of which are reminiscent of the Zimbardo experiment. But the one that sticks out and that I shared at APA was that I think it was on my second day um, as I uh, was in Edgeworth One was the name of the ward. And it was a beautiful sunny day and the doors to the backyard were open uh, and backyard was a walled in kind of part of the psychiatric hospital, uh, reminiscent of many of the jail backyards that I've come to see since. And uh, through the door of that backyard uh, came a rather impressively large uh, man that stood in front of me and asked me for a sweetie, as he called it, sweetie is a word for candy in England. Um, he was uh, intimidating to me, but also left me curious. Uh, and eventually he realized that uh, I didn't have any such thing. He left uh, and I um, asked uh, my fellow uh, nurse practitioners uh, and nursing assistants uh, who this was. And they said uh, this was Lucy that I had just met and that Lucy had been uh, inside the hospital for a very, very long time. Uh, Lucy and I uh, crossed paths many times after that and I became 
curious about uh, his story, uh, including the name. And Lucy really was what uh, we would now call uh, a person from the trans population. And Lucy was born into a middle class, uh, fairly reputable family in the area. And uh, as a result, uh, they would uh, not accept uh, his gender identity and try to change it through a variety of strategies, including uh, medication, uh, ECT, and eventually a lobotomy. And the lobotomy led to him being lifetime uh, psychiatrically uh, disabled and staying inside the psychiatric hospital. Uh, or incarcerated, if you wish. Uh, I, I sometimes fail to see the difference between the two institutions having uh, been in both of them. And this alerted me to something that has really informed uh, a lifetime passion of mine, and that is that we have set up human service systems to aid our fellow human beings, and yet not only do they frequently fail uh, at the goal that they have set out for themselves, they often uh, actually create more harm than good. And that was a startling, uh, devastating realization to me. And suddenly the full-time with benefit and vacation pay job to help human beings didn't look so shiny any longer. Um, I, I fast forward uh, very quickly and, and then I just make room for some uh, questions because this is what this session is really all about. So fast forward uh, into subsequently for a brief while living uh, in New Zealand, five years, uh, and working for an organization that was rooted in anti-psychiatry principles called the Richmond Fellowship International. Uh, Thomas Zass and others were instrumental in forming this particular uh, initiative. And it was my pleasure, it was a, a kind of consumer-run organization to facilitate a support group uh, for women. Many of them had been a long time uh, psychiatrically, uh, uh, um, kind of in, in psychiatric institutions, institutionalized. And uh, it was 10 women, uh, ages 20 to 62, and uh, all of them had a sexual abuse history. And so this alerted me to another key principle of community psychology, and that is that what happens to us and the outcomes that uh, we experience are rooted in a much broader ecology. Uh, I didn't have the terminology for that at that particular uh, point in time, but it alerted me to the fact that uh, what, how we behave and how we think is intensely rooted in the history from which we come. It also alerted me to the fact that there's often similarities between histories and that it was clearly not coincidental that these women had experienced significant mental health issues and also had a sexual abuse history. Fast forward from that into uh, eventually uh, coming to live in Canada, which is where I am to the present day in the community where I landed. And I worked in child welfare and I thought to myself, you know what, this is uh, where I'm going to make the change because I have seen how hard it is to heal from past histories of abuse, I felt I was going up, as I called it, the prevention continuum a notch. I was taking it into childhood and I was going to assist young children to heal before long-term harm uh, became visible in their life. And of course, I learned devastatingly uh, that no matter how recent or distant the harm that we have experienced, healing is always fraught with many difficulties and challenges. And that despite the fact that we have whole systems of practice set up to affect that healing, we're actually not that effective in it. Uh, the best we can do is to support people uh, to become resilient in the face of adversity. And it was a, a little girl uh, that one day uh, said to me when she disclosed the sexual abuse history at the end of a group session of about 10 to 11 weeks, and I asked her why she had waited to disclose right until the end. She said to me, well, because this is the child welfare system. She was, uh, she was a quite precocious little uh, girl. Uh, this is the child welfare system. And what I want you to do, Chris, I want you to tell my dad, uh, the uh, kind of perpetrator in this case was her brother, to stop the behavior. But I don't want you to take him away because I love him. So this alerted me to another dynamic. And that is that we frequently 
are patronizing in the way we set up our system, including uh, towards children by not hearing their voices. She wanted the behavior to stop, but she also wanted to have acknowledged that she loved her dad. And then as a final part of my story, that then led me to say, okay, so like where can we begin to prevent these issues from happening in the first place, the end result of which I had seen. And I thought to myself, well, it appears to me that we have not asked the people who have uh, uh, perpetrated the offense of sexual abuse. So as part of my community psychology master's uh, degree, I kind of came to my university education as what they call a mature student because I didn't have a high school degree. So uh, I sometimes think that's a contradiction in, in words, but never mind. Um, so as part of my master thesis, I devoted my master thesis and Jeff Nelson was my advisor to trying to speak uh, to men who had sexually abused uh, children to figure out what it was that had led them to that. It was a purely qualitative research study. I basically turned on my microphone and said, tell me a life story. I got 270 uh, dizzying pages of transcripts uh, that I then tried to uh, thematically analyze. And I found many things, but I found two key things. One is that the very harm that they committed against other people, they had experienced themselves. And often, if there is a, a, a kind of a hierarchy of harm, uh, I doubt there is, but if there were one, uh, some of the things that they described were uh, so devastating uh, that it was hard to believe they were uh, still talking to me at the time. So I learned that, but most significantly, I learned that not one of the men had ever spoken about their history of abuse until they, in turn, were arrested for having perpetrated abuse. And that got me very curious, and it led me to the key principle that silence isn't golden, and yet we silence dynamics uh, uh, of power imbalance, um, oppression, and harm actively in our community. And then we design a system to attempt to heal from that on an individual basis that I think is utterly ill-equipped to do so. So that uh, got me into the whole uh, area of uh, crime prevention through social development and seeing everything that people do within ecological context which is where I'm presently at. But I'll stop for a second, because uh, Tom, you look curious. I can see your face, but not anybody else's. So um, are there any comments or questions? I love it when people uh, disagree with me, by the way. Chris, I have a, this is Kyra Brown. Can you hear me? I can. Can you hear Kyra? Yeah. Um, I can. I think she's muted. Um, so uh, very fascinating, interesting. Um, Chris, could you speak a little bit to um, just, you know, with the work being started and you know, these revelations and trying to um, put that paradigm shift into action, what was that like in, you know, and, and perhaps being new to the community that you just settled in, could you speak to how you navigated, um, one, putting the paradigm shift into action and doing the work and having to um, do that work within the context of um, the community that you were working in that already has kind of this um, mindset of how to do this work? Does that make sense? Uh, let, let me see if I can, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So let me see if I can try. One of the uh, largest challenges in attempting to do so uh, is that we have very large systems, and these systems have attached to them uh, amazingly resilient ideologies. Uh, one of those systems is the system of justice. Uh, another system is the system of enforcement. And while my experiences, as you heard, kind of span four different countries, uh, having since had the opportunity to speak to people in my role in different parts of uh, the world, there is some striking similarities between them. One of the key similarity is that we uh, individualize problems and we individualize them for uh, the reason that it lets us off the hook. 
Uh, we like to own our heroes, but we don't like to own our failures. So we like to uh, speak of um, what would be a Canadian, uh, Wayne Gretzky, Hawking, um, right? Uh, but we don't want to speak of uh, Paul Bernardo. And that ideology is pervasive. Uh, it is, I think, actively taught in uh, some of our services, even if we teach it from the perspective uh, of um, compassion uh, and uh, wanting to become, uh, you know, a well-versed human service worker, it still comes from the perspective of uh, individualizing uh, the challenges. And I'm getting interrupted by a colleague, I apologize, I was just... Um, uh, distracted there. So that, that was one of the largest challenges. I was really fortunate, uh, it's Kayla, right? Um, that uh, I uh, am doing this work within the context of Waterloo region that has a long standing history of restorative justice. So what that did is that allows for the fact uh, that uh, individuals are seen within the context uh, of community and that crimes are regarded beyond individual failings as something that uh, is really harming the fabric uh, of the community overall, so that the offender-victim dynamic was not as strong in this community as it might be in others. Um, so that was the, the, one of the largest um, challenges. And when I say, uh, Kyra, that the um, uh, ideology is pervasive as we hosted community meetings, town hall meetings, I had drank coffee and talked to uh, all kinds of stakeholders. Uh, it is so pervasive that just about everybody had something to say around how to prevent crime. And it almost never got to the very place where I wanted to go to, and that is to look at the root conditions underlying it. Yeah, I, I was very struck by one of the things you, you said, which was that in the uh, state hospital institution, a very high percentage of the women had been sexually abused. And 40 years ago, when we started to do the early work in uh, child sexual abuse, and we were going in just doing workshops for the providers, telling them what it is, someone went to the, the inpatient unit and came back to us and said, 70% of the women here say they were abused as a child. So it was remarkable that that data was so easily obtained by someone just asking, and we were never correlating it. With, with the event. And then you talk about the men who never had been asked. And that, that gets to the issue of how do you ask the men or the women, you know, have you been sexually abused? And the, and the barriers we have to go through uh, because of society, but also because of our clinical belief that it's not a, 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 a <laughs> today on television we can tell, it's not a pervasive, you know, something across all of society, it must be something unique and individual to that family. And yet, turn on the television today and you'll hear that it's you know, quite pervasive. So uh, it's an interesting, your issues of how do you break in with it are quite interesting. Yeah, and I, I, I would uh, suggest that in uh, our social services, which is why this was such a difficult topic, crime prevention to social development, we do occasionally go from blaming the victim and blaming the offender to blaming the family, but we almost never go beyond that. So for anybody to suggest that we need to look at cultural assumptions underlying the objectification uh, of, uh, of children in this case uh, was, was just not um, something that was well received. It, 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 it staggers me to the present day, and I've now been in this job for 20 plus years, why it is possible for us uh, to continue to spend billions of dollars in a system that we know is failing us, uh, contrary uh, to the evidence, when there is all kinds of other more proactive measures uh, with a greater return on investment. And the only way that I can explain it to myself is through the need of othering. As long as I can put a prison, and we have a prison in this community, up there on the hill in which I put the people that are the undesirables, there is something that is better about me. And as I understood that psychology, it was really helpful for me in terms of talking to stakeholders because 
uh, then I had to really consider their psychology, whether the chief of police, the head of government, or the head of a local neighborhood or association, or myself. We all have aspects of that ideology that remains unexamined. Uh, and that's uh, been a lifelong quest for me in this job. So do you want to hear a bit about what I'm doing now? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so I was uh, hired in 95 uh, by regional government. So I am together with uh, now seven other staff uh, paid by government. Uh, but I report to a multidisciplinary uh, body called the World Norwegian Crime Prevention Council. And it is a kind of transdisciplinary uh, initiative uh, in which some of the key stakeholders, it's such an overused word, some of the key decision makers and power brokers in the community that can get to the underlying conditions uh, to crime, uh, sit around the table on a monthly basis uh, and try to engage in uh, social development problem solving. So for that to become possible, we had to first to identify what are the underlying conditions uh, to uh, crime and victimization and also fear of crime. And lo and behold, they're actually really well documented. In fact, I found a document not too long ago, but a couple of years ago, when 1847 wardens uh, of prisons in Canada spoke about problematic substance use, poverty, uh, uh, kind of dysfunctional families, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is not new knowledge. My job was to bring that knowledge to the stakeholder group as an underpinning philosophy and begin to design a way out of that. And of course, the pressures were immense to uh, go the project route. Do a project for disengaged youth, do a project in the neighborhood. But uh, I continued to try and encourage the organization to look at it more systemically and more long-term. Uh, so what started as a pilot project for I think the funding for two and a half years eventually became co-funded uh, and uh, has been in existence um, uh, ever since. Um, in terms of the kind of work that we have done and, and continue to do, I probably the easiest to categorize it uh, is as such as it is reflected in our current, uh, what we call Smart on Crime Plan, which is our community, uh, if you wish, strategic plan, and you can see it on our website. What, what we do is to not provide the service, but to try and animate existing services to take upstream prevention seriously. So we have child welfare, education, social services, public health, uh, clown attorneys, et cetera, et cetera, coming together um, to look at uh, issues inside and outside the community, geography-based or population-based. The work that staff provide to support that is knowledge exchange uh, and uh, public education, including some uh, public education campaigns. Uh, facilitation, um, being a catalyst to stimulate actions uh, in various parts uh, of the community and so on. And at the time in 1995, when I presented at APA about this, uh, I, I showed a photograph from the um, movie Home Alone, because I, when I came here, I was essentially told, write us a crime prevention plan. And I think what government had in mind is that I would go away into an expert office, I would look at social development data, and I would write a um, uh, social development plan that uh, then would basically dust away in shelves because that's what governments commonly do. But instead, I had, to, I, I had nowhere to go to, to even look at a model plan, maybe a little bit in Montreal. Uh, and there were some things from the States and in Europe, but there was really nothing of its nature in Canada. So instead of doing that, I had to engage in that core principle that I started with. I had to talk myself out of the role of expertise and say, I can here facilitate a community discussion about this. I can dig into the data and bring those two things together, but I can tell you how to fix this. Uh, and that too was not very popular, but eventually became uh, embraced. And I think Tom and you and I last talked about Einstein's ladder of participation. <laughs> Um, I use that a lot. 
uh, I, I said, I'm, I don't want to do a community consultation and get the community to buy into a preordained plan. I want to really hear what people are saying in all parts of the community and then see what we collectively have. It led to a document in 1996 that was truly collectively written. I think we had 147 people participate in the writing of the document. Uh, death by collective writing, by the way, I cannot recommend it. It was like it was painful. Um, but that became the underpinning document for the work that we do to the current day. Uh, and then, um, just maybe as a quick final comment, and then I, I'll open it up again. Uh, I think it was around 2000, actually it was around 99, when a government consultant, federal in this case, uh, wanted to interview me and uh, for a, a national strategy. This was strategy number three. Uh, and I became a little fed up and I said, you know what, I, I not, don't want to be interviewed anymore about being the community practitioner. I called myself the token community practitioner in, in the work. Um, I want to do my own thing. And so this consultant, myself and uh, others uh, across Canada formed what we call the, the Canadian Forum on Crime Prevention. Uh, in Waterloo Region, my community in 2003, we hosted uh, an event that brought together 120 people, uh, community practitioners, researchers, policy makers, and elected officials, and we wrote what uh, is called the Agenda for a Safer Canada. And those were the humble beginnings of what is now known as the Canadian Municipal Network on Crime Prevention. Uh, that is now uh, 30 uh, municipalities large, covering about 50% of the Canadian population uh, uh, engaging in crime prevention through municipal and social development. Am I hopping all over the place? Am I still making any sense here to people at all? Uh, yes. Okay. So uh, why don't I pause for a second and see if there's some comments or questions about it. You make it sound so easy. What what were what were some of the harder parts, and what are some of the specifics of what you're actually doing? Because uh, you, you you know you present a pretty radical view of uh, crime prevention, and I, I know if I presented a quarter of that, they'd throw me out of the room. So you had not only got accepted into one community, but you then that spread all across. So what was it that you were able to do or sell? that got people to uh, buy this approach. I mean, your, your values in, in your materials, and I will make sure that you get, people get the link to it. Uh, it's a document called Smart on Crime. Collaboration, commitment, compassion, courage. I'll follow you anywhere. You know, <laughs> I mean, those are, are great values. So how did that work? Oh, well, uh, when people ask me, um, and not infrequently on airplanes, when you tend to be stuck with a person, what you do for a living, I always want to say to them, I drive trucks, uh, because it's so hard to explain uh, what my job actually is. The second you say crime prevention, they say, oh, you must be working with police, because that's still the dominant view of who pre uh, does crime prevention. So two key things, I believe, um, have helped me along the way. Uh, one is I like to drink coffee, so I drank coffee with just about anybody who was prepared to. So I have a core principle uh, that I maintain to the present day. I don't care who you are, whether you have power or no power, whether you walked off the streets or you're the head of government. If you want to talk about crime prevention and social development, I have a coffee with you. And I think there is something liberating in the flat structure of that approach. So we, uh, on an annual basis, uh, do an, a retreat for members of the Crime Prevention Council. We had them band dancing, we had them drumming, we, we uh, get them to see each other as people. And I think that is liberating uh, for people to experience, even people in positions of power. And so when they come back on a monthly basis and we do review ever so often what posts them back, that's the key thing they comment on. A high level of trust among the stakeholders, and there's 42 in total, um, at the table whereby they can say things without getting run out of the room. 
whereby they can ask tough questions where they can frequently, they say things like, so not speaking for my organization, but here is something I've been thinking. So that, that's been helpful, I think. Uh, listening to people, hearing them out, not going in with a preconceived notion and, um, uh, and saying to them, your voice matters. Uh, there's no wrong question, there's no wrong suggestion. So that's been a part of it. So we've, fought, we've built a team of people that like each other. Uh, we have a maximum term of 10 years and nobody wanted to leave. So now we created a lifetime honorary membership because people want to keep coming to the meetings. Uh, which, which is a little unique. Who wants to go to meetings? Uh, and I know that I often don't. So, so relationships first is our key principle. Trust building, always safeguard the relationship. Um, so doing, uh, you know, a lot of that. And I think the second part probably is, uh, and I frequently say this when we work with neighborhoods, is if I'm not the expert that can fix it for you, by extension it must mean there is a shared expertise and you have a part in that. And particularly people who come from a background of uh, oppression or feeling disempowered or feeling that they're always being done to rather than done with, uh, that kind of what we used to call an empowerment agenda, and I hope we can call it that again without it feeling like an overused word, uh, I think has been, has been central. What's the hardest part about it? The hours are unbelievably long because you don't build relationships between nine and five. You can't miss a beat if somebody at the table is disengaged or grumpy or there is a tension between two members, it's my job to call that and say, how do we, how do we get back to being in a healthy relationship? Because we can create a safe community out there if we don't have a safe community in here. That was always one of our uh, core principles. And by extension, um, I have to make myself vulnerable. I can't be a professional at a distance to the people I work with, whether these are the street involved people that I meet every morning on my way because I live downtown and work downtown and whom I now know by name and they want to chat with me, or whether these are the heads of government that I connect with. I have to put myself in the picture if I want to expect them to do the same. And what has often kept us at a distance to the population we serve is that that's the very thing we don't do. In fact, it's called a boundary infraction. If I share my personal story, I have just talked myself out of a position of power and the association between being a good therapist, let's say for argument's sake, uh, and healing often means that you never ever do that. If you've ever gone through therapy, uh, I have, like, you know, they, they almost apologize with, sorry, I shouldn't have told you that story because that's about me. Well, no, you should have told me that story because it humanizes you and it's really about human connections. So, so let's hear questions from others. I'm sorry? I said, let's hear some questions from others. We've got quite a few people here and I know they are very active minds. Okay. <laughs> So we have in Wichita um, a coordinating council that works post-adjudication. So it's intended um, to be a, a recidivist uh, prevention, so almost tertiary prevention at that point. Um, and I would really like to see a focus be more on that primary prevention piece. Do you have any thoughts or experience about turning some of those committees that do exist, but are currently focused on that post adjudication piece to a, a more farther upstream? Uh, yes, I, I think most folks that come to those kinds of committees uh, come with uh, some of the same desires that we all have, right? They want to make the world a better place. And they uh, fairly quickly uh, get disenchanted if we give them the opportunity to uh, speak about that with the fact that they, they are dealing with the revolving door syndrome. 
So we have at the Crime Prevention Council table the Crown Attorney. His job in this case of him uh, is really, uh, you know, to lock people up. We have the warden of the local jail. Her job uh, is to keep people locked up once they've been charged and sentenced and convicted. Um, we have, you know, the chief of police whose job it is to catch the bad guys. But when you dig beneath those things, they, they have a level of frustration with it. And so upstream prevention can become that visionary aspirational piece that we all share no matter which discipline that uh, we come from. Uh, frequently, uh, when I've spoken to people working in those types of services, they're uh, seeing the same people coming back. So there is a revolving door. And worse than that, they're now seeing intergenerational challenges. So some of the young women in the local jail are the daughters of the women that were previously in the local jail. Um, so upstream prevention uh, can be uh, a relief for people. <coughs> Sorry. I think we're seeing this in, the, in this country as each community faces the opiate crisis. And the ones who are uh, dealing with it without a prevention perspective and without a, 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 a social context are you know, just very frustrated because the numbers are going up and all they're doing is injecting them so they don't die. And there are other models out there uh, that can tempt them uh, to, to, to see a different way. Uh, are you finding that in your communities? Anybody seeing the opiate crisis and, and the approach being so much like what Nicole's describing in Wichita and what Chris described early on being the way they treated things in Canada? I was uh, uh, just at a meeting yesterday, uh, actually, Tom, where we found, uh, and this is the work I'm hoping to do with you uh, by coming to Canada, uh, that uh, whole neighborhoods are now divided. Because on the one hand, we have people that have clearly problematic substance use issues. And on the other hand, we have people in neighborhoods worried about the real estate costs. Because, you know, there's needles in their front yard or, you know, there's sex work going on in their backyard and, and all the rest of it. And those are often the very people that actually can, uh, Nicole, be inspired to uh, be your best allies and say, yes, we need to do this work. This is vital work because it saves lives and it heals communities. But let's think a little bit ahead about the future generation. So we brought in, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Iceland model. Um, Iceland had a uh, horrendous uh, kind of problematic substance use issues with teens. And they have implemented uh, some universal prevention policies. Uh, I let you look up uh, those uh, at your leisure or we have them on our YouTube channel on the crime prevention side. We, we brought them here to speak about it, and we had 700 people uh, in uh, attendance over two days. And these were the people doing often the, the direct treatment or harm reduction measures, but they're fed up with uh, not seeing uh, an end to it. So. And we can capitalize on that frustration. Sounds a little terrible, but yeah. <laughs> well, that, that, and that, that's one example of, of finding someone who's doing it differently and bringing them into your community. And in Massachusetts early on, for some reason, I don't know, the town of Gloucester decided to decriminalize the approach to opiate. And that then became a model and it's a cop. So you can bring a cop in to talk to your cop because it's not some highfalutin, you know, criminal justice expert. It's someone who tried it in their community and find that, finds that it's working. But I, I know what Nicole's describing, and I think we all know it, which is you go into a group of people who have functioned a certain kind of way with a lot of other people at the table who've also functioned a certain kind of way, and you want them to look at doing things differently, and uh, it, they often look at you as if you have three heads. Yeah. One, a couple of things that uh, we, we found helpful, uh, we just got talking about it yesterday. One is actually the importance of uh, language and changing language. Um, I have underestimated that. Uh, you know, it would get me an eye roll around uh, political correctness gone crazy uh, from me. But what I found is that by saying to our local media, no, they're not prostitutes, they're sex workers. 
uh, and they're not addicts, they're people with a problematic substance use issue, etc., 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 you begin to create a greater um, culture of compassion. Uh, so that was a, a significant part for us. So we actually have a glossary to our integrated drug strategy where we say to people, when you say this, uh, we actually think you mean that. Uh, so, you know, so that's uh, been something, uh, you know, that we have <clears throat> done not, uh, not infrequently. Um, and, you know, a big part of our job, of course, is uh, listening. And, uh, and I found that there's often no translation between the direct service and the people that make the policy decisions. When I worked in a psychiatric hospital, I used to call them the suits. You know, the people that would make decisions about my working life, but they never even met the patient yet. Um, so the, the people around the Crime Prevention Council table ostensibly are the suits, like these are the decision makers. They're not the direct service people, but we engage with both areas um, in an attempt to kind of see where the horizontal and vertical level can meet, right? There's that, that nucleus. Um, and we have a, a document, uh, we call it the Integrated Model for Crime Prevention, and the, the subtitle is Who Leads What When? Because often in communities, we're not very clear about who leads what when. And we, we rely on uh, same old, same old to take on leadership, and they may be actually inappropriately placed for that particular uh, situation in that role. Uh, so those two things uh, have been helpful to us over time in, in, in taking things further upstream. We have a cute little video, by the way, Nicole, uh, uh, about um, a guy behind uh, bars. It's 90 seconds long about uh, going upstream. If you uh, want to beg for or steal it, you're welcome to it. It's on our YouTube channel. You know, you talk casually about the fact you talk to all these media people and you have a guide of language you give them. But most coalitions don't talk to the media. And the media drives so much of this. The very first coalition I did was around deinstitutionalization. Uh, the city of Northampton, where there were deinstitutionalizing a state hospital and a VA hospital. And the headlines used to be, would read, ex mental health patient throws stone through window. You know, and we had a lot of time um, trying to get both, you know, all the groups, the media, to start to think about this in a different kind of way, because these were now our neighbors. Right. Um, and uh, that was unique, and I don't think a lot of people do it, but the media can keep this stuff going forever, and they actually don't mind talking to us, but we do mind talking to them because we feel like they always portray us badly. We, we in the president, the media always portrays us badly. I, I <laughs> learned over time that the media can be your best friend. Uh, and a big part of this job is to make friends of your uh, least likely friends. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm of the principle, if I can uh, bring them into my tent, they're not on the outside throwing rocks at it. And so we do that through sometimes making their job easy. Uh, we give them the data and the stats and they can build the story about it. We bring them stories on slow news days. Uh, so when we need to challenge them around their language or certain reporting, again, we have a relationship. So now it, I just did it a couple of days ago uh, with uh, somebody in the local media. I, sent her a personal email and I said, mm, that was bad reporting and you know it, and here's why, right? I, you can't do that call, but if you have a relationship, then, then it's a little different. How about some others, comments, questions? Now, wait a second, we decided this was a format that was going to work because in the peer calls, everybody's chatting. We have to just shut each other up because we talk over each other. And we brought, and I promised Chris she wasn't going to have to talk at us because this is a very talkative group. So either I'm a liar or you're giving me a hard time. Hi, everyone. It's Olga. I have a question. So I know you've talked a lot about your work, and I am always thinking about how do we expand in, in terms of the impact. Do you see your work being as accepted across the world 
as it is right now by the Canadian government? I apologize, I lost your, your last point. Uh, so you're asking about impact. Um, yeah, and I'm wondering uh, in terms of acceptance, so we know there's so many different programs across the world that you hear about it in, in this part of the world or that part of the world. Do you see maybe your model being accepted um, across, you know, outside of Canada? Uh, yes, uh, just back actually from speaking at a prevention congress in uh, Dresden, Germany. So Germany, uh, which is where I'm, I'm born, uh, but that's a coincidence, have a rather large municipally-based uh, prevention network and uh, they invited us uh, to the international uh, colloquium contingent to uh, give a presentation. And uh, what um, we found that fascinated them uh, and if you uh, have spent time in Europe, uh, you would understand why, uh, was the, the grassroots nature of this, right? So it started with a few people in this community, and then it grew within this community, and then eventually it grew in Canada, and now we have national funding for the network, and we've influenced national policy on several occasions. That's not how it's done in Europe, right? In Europe, the federal government kind of says, like, municipality from here in, you shall, and then municipalities have no choice. So the whole notion of, uh, well, it's the old Margaret Mead quote, uh, you know, never underestimate what a committed group of citizens can do to change the world. The, the really key part for me in that quote is the last part. It is, in fact, the only thing that ever has. Because what I have observed is that, uh, yes, you can change national policy uh, from the grassroots up. And that has fascinated other communities, uh, uh, certainly uh, in Europe. And uh, we do connect with uh, some networks in the States uh, as well, California City Network being one of them. Um, so I would say uh, with uh, Canadian politeness, we have put ourselves <laughs> a little bit onto the uh, international agenda when it comes to crime prevention. It's interesting. I did some work on um, anti-Semitism and hate in Europe where they wanted to do some coalition building and they had no concept of coalition building. They could not get it. They couldn't get the idea of working together. Uh, it's such a, a hierarchical uh, set of governments uh, at all levels. Um, so I'm impressed that you got as far as you did. Uh, it's very foreign to them. Other comments? So what, what, what are you sitting on thinking about? Carlos just sent us the link, which is very helpful to the materials that, that uh, uh, Chris has been talking about. Can I ask a question? Do you sure. Do any of the folks uh, on the call um, have a local uh, crime prevention uh, or upstream prevention initiative? In your communities, no? Hmm. Yeah, we do here in, in Lawrence, Kansas. And, um, and I've been pretty involved with it and, and it's actually taking several different forms. And, it's kind of morphed into several other initiatives now, one of which is um, an initiative to create um, really a behavioral health unit as part of the hospital, but it's gonna be a freestanding building and it's gonna be um, accessible for people um, for detox, because um, a lot of our crime is driven by alcohol and drug use here. And um, one of the biggest complaints that we've had from um, both police as well as um, people who have been guests of our jail um, has really been that there really needs to be a detox that they don't need to be going to jail all the time. They need um, some crisis management more than anything else. And so that's what we're trying to create is really more of a crisis management kind of a scenario. And my gosh, we've been working on it for two years. And every time I think we make some progress, it's like, oh my God, there's like another barrier put up for us. And part of it is funding and part of it is the lack of data on what the need is. And that's what we're really struggling with. I'm actually about to, I might have to jump off the, the call early because I'm 
about to run to another meeting, really around data sharing across the county sheriff, um, the Lawrence Police Department, the jail system, um, the hospital, several of the substance abuse treatment programs. And it really had the root, the roots of it were the crime prevention um, side of it. And in reality, what we're needing to deal with is a really complicated and, and often frustrating drug treatment need, alcohol treatment need in our, in our community. And I feel like I'm getting back to where my roots were. You were talking earlier about your, the, the roots of some of your work, Chris, was in sexual abuse prevention and in this recognition that the, the rate of sexual assault and sexual abuse was much higher than people were letting on. And it sure is. I used to be assistant director of a residential treatment facility in New Hampshire. And that's actually how I got into this business um, in the 19, late, in mid to late 1980s. All of the kids that I was doing intakes and admissions with had a sexual, a serious sexual abuse history. And we weren't dealing with it. Well, I was going down to Massachusetts, I was up in Maine, I was in New Hampshire, I was up in Quebec, I was all over the place trying to um, figure out how it was that we would um, be able to meet that need and folks were not stepping up to the plate for that. We eventually created, I, I ended up quitting my job at, at this residential facility um, and designed a sexual abuse treatment um, facility for younger kids to try to get upstream with the treatment side of it. Um, and, and really wanted to get into the primary prevention side of it. So I came to Kansas to deal with the primary prevention of that and a whole variety of different issues. And it's just so heartening to hear your story and the work that you've been able to facilitate in Canada. I'm really looking forward to jumping into your website, looking at the videos on your YouTube channel. Um, but, but here, I'm seeing a lot of that and talking to people on the street. I'm, I'm seeing a return to back, back to a lot of the earlier precursors in people's lives to this broader alcohol and drug use and homelessness problem having to do with an earlier history of sexual abuse. And it's like, oh my God, can't we, can't we deal with it already? It's such a challenge to a community I to say, we're going to look at this and show you that very high numbers of, of, of kids are being sexually abused. We, did, we started doing this in a town of 6,000. And that means their neighbors. That means the people who sell them stuff in the store. And we, we see this in the denial in this hearing in Washington right now. Oh boy, Yale boys don't do that. You know, Athol and Orange kids don't do that. And um, we would do an exercise in the Valuing Our Children program out of a curriculum, I forget the guy's name, where the, the parents would mark the parts of their bodies where they had been abused physically or sexually. And they would just put X's all over the place. And it was such an, all you, all you had to do is ask and you get all this information. So that um, it's so, uh, but, it, but, but there's so much shame and so much covering up uh, of, of it. So you're really, you know, if you're saying, well, there's opiates around here, that's one thing if you're saying, Hey, you know, your uncle and your mom are, are uh, 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 abusing the nieces and nephews. That's very threatening. So uh, it, it's an interesting piece. And so it's exciting to see Chris's work that sort of puts it on the table and makes it a societal issue and in a, in a room full of suits where they can't deny that. I would be interested uh, if uh, others are at some point to have a conversation about a couple of aspects uh, related to that. One is that I believe our uh, continuum of prevention is too short. So, uh, so Vincent, we talk about you know universal prevention and going upstream. We're trying to kind of look even a little further ahead and say what are the structural pieces that prevent us from actually doing universal prevention. So structural violence. How is that built into our system? Uh, and the second piece that I would love uh, to have a, a practitioner conversation about is the, uh, the unbelievably devastating impact of shaming. Because shaming only ever leads to division. So when I did my interviews with the men who had sexually offended, I became stigmatized along with them. Why was I even willing to hear their story? Well, I was willing to hear their story because I tried to understand their story so I could go upstream. 
Uh, and what I found and said in my thesis is I really liked some of them. How could I? Right? So we tend to identify and over-identify people with their victim status and their offender status, and there we stop, and then we're surprised that people are self-numbing with opioids and whatever else it may be. So shame is such a divisive um, aspect of the work that we do, and I would, I would love to have like several sessions on that sometime to see how we can really get beyond that division. Well, let me take that as a nibble. Uh, any, anybody interested in having uh, Chris come back and have a discussion like that with us? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. And yeah. So let, 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 let me bring a close to this. First, by a, a huge thanks to you, Chris. Wonderful story. You've been a wonderful guest, and you've modeled how, how we can do this. Um, I would love to get feedback from those of you as to whether this format works and what else we could do to make it different. Um, we're just playing with it. Uh, and if you have other thoughts about guests, uh, our, our plan at this point, and Nicole, you can check me out, is that next month will be a regular uh, call from the uh, uh, Prevention Council talking about uh, the biennial. Well, you make it sound so exciting, a regular call. Um, yes, we're going to have a brainstorming next month. So um, please, everyone who enjoyed this conversation, um, feel free to come back and start brainstorming about how we can move things through the biennial. Yeah, and that is always an exciting conversation. <laughs> and then um, uh, Kyra, who was on earlier, has agreed to be visiting with us in November. 